The video looks phenomenal. See, this difference between Black Star Network and Black-owned media and something like CNN. You can't be Black-owned media and be skate. It's time to be smart. Bring your eyeballs home. You dig?
Monday, March 18th, 2024, coming up on Roller Martin Unfiltered, streaming live on the Black Star Network from Los Angeles. Uh, the Movement for Black Lives has an essay series that explores their policy vision for economic justice. We'll talk to uh, their public policy expert about that and what it means for the black community. Also, as the gang violence in Haiti uh, continues to expand into more affluent parts of the country, some U.S. citizens are back on American soil while others are still waiting to get out. 
Uh, Niger is kicking U.S. troops out of the country. We'll talk to a national security and foreign policy expert about what this means for that country and other African nations. Also, the White House held a Women's History Month reception during which President Biden signed an executive order strengthening research into women's health care. Supreme Court justices are deciding if the government can regulate misinformation from social media. We'll talk about that as well. Plus, uh, we NAACP Image Awards took place uh, in Los Angeles on Saturday. We'll tell you uh, who won uh, and who the big winners that night and hear from some of those winners. You're watching Roland Martin Unfiltered right here on the Black Star Network. It's time to bring the funk. Let's go. He's got whatever the miss, he's on it. Whatever it is, he's got the scoop, the fact, the fine. And when it breaks, he's right on time. And it's rolling. Best believe he's knowing. Putting it down from sports to news to politics. With entertainment just for kicks, he's rolling. Nonprofit Quarterly and the Movie for Black Lives are launching a six-part series focused on uh, social justice. Uh, right now, we're going to talk with uh, Dr. Amara Inyev. She is the Movie for Black Lives public policy expert. Uh, glad to have you here on the show. So first and foremost, walk us through what is this six-part series and what do you hope to accomplish with it? Absolutely. It's really great uh, to be here with you, Roland, uh, to talk about this series. So we launched this series uh, last year, in fact, because we felt that it was absolutely imperative to talk about what an economic policy vision for black people must look like. Uh, we have been tracking, particularly in the last three, four years since COVID, the economic fallout uh, for black communities. We have been tracking uh, issues around wealth or the lack thereof for black communities. We've been tracking issues around housing, the unaffordability of housing, um, conversations around guaranteed basic income, reparations. Uh, and it was important for us to set forth what is a vision, an economic policy vision for black people that addresses the economic injustices, but also is forward thinking, forward facing. And so we partnered with Nonprofit Quarterly uh, to do this series uh, and put forth and engaged a number of folks who are on the ground doing this work, experts who can really um, help us to craft that vision and, and really put it forth to the masses. So again, vision is one thing, but reality is another. And so what do you hope this is going to accomplish, uh, is going to achieve? How, how do you get people, how, how do you make uh, this economic issue a reality? Absolutely. So that's a great question. So one of the things that we tried to do was make sure that in every article in the series, it sets forth concrete examples where work is already taking place on the ground with the idea that our people are not just, we're not just speaking theoretically about what's possible, but we are talking about initiatives that have actually been launched uh, where people can plug in and amplifying work that's already happening. So for example, uh, we lifted up uh, guaranteed basic income pilots that have uh, gotten off the ground in, in cities across the country. We are talking about participatory budgeting, uh, which is a mechanism that can be used to create more control for our communities over their municipal uh, budgets. Uh, we've talked about the work that's already happening in the philanthropic space around reparations. Uh, and we talk about reparations for the war on drugs uh, and what that looks like. We talked about housing and some of the organizing that's actually happening in places like Washington, D.C. And so we wanted to make sure that everything that we're putting forth is, is grounded in the reality and the material conditions of our people. And so we're not operating just in theory or, you know, pie in the sky thinking, but what is actually going to tangibly affect uh, black people's lives. Well, one of the things, so do, do y'all address uh, all of these corporations that announce billions of dollars to the black community in the wake of the death of George Floyd? And frankly, most of that hasn't even been spent. Um, 
I haven't seen, I, I've raised this issue with the NAACP, with the National Urban League. Uh, I've spoken about this at HBCUs. Uh, and so who is, what organization, who is going to hold these people accountable to the promises that they made? Is this a part of this? Well, it's certainly part of the conversation. And so we've done uh, pieces of the past and even organized in the past around the mm. lack of or really the lack of follow-through from many of the corporations that made these uh, pledges uh, in 2020. And then when we looked maybe a year later, even two years later, we found that there wasn't that much follow-through. And so a lot of our work has been in shining light on that lack of follow-through, also really trying to get beneath the layers of the PR, the public relations campaigns that many of these corporations have put, had put forth, uh, claiming that they wanted to invest in our communities, claiming that they wanted to, um, to have some impact on these long-standing injustices, the wealth gap, et cetera. And so we've worked to shine light on not only the issues, but the commitments and the lack of follow-through, um, that there no one, no entity is exempt from their responsibility in addressing, for example, the size of the wealth gap and our ability to hold these corporations accountable and to be unafraid to do so is something that we've, that we've stood on. Uh, but again, shining light is one thing, uh, but um, uh, who is calling them out? Are there plans for the movement of black lives to actually uh, uh, to protest, to do more? Because again, whenever we have, look, it's just like when I talk, when we talk about money he, here in this industry here, uh, we're trying to hold uh, these companies accountable for the $340 billion being spent every single year in advertising. Black-owned media gets 1%. Then we look at the money that's being spent in venture capital. We're talking about less than 2%. I mean, we can go on and on and on. Uh, and so uh, you have folks, you have a number of people out there who are advocating for reparations. I'm also saying there are billions upon billions upon billions of dollars uh, upwards, heading towards a trillion dollars that are being spent every single year. The federal government, 560, 600 billion dollars in contracts annually, 1.67 percent going to African-Americans. Uh, and so there are, there's real money being dropped right now that we are not a part of. And I think part of the issue is that we do not have uh, a collective um, action to, to deal with in terms of pushing people to say, no, no, we got to start not just shining a light, but, but putting you on front street. The Russian Black Caucus at the foundation at AOC this year, they had a big meeting focusing on uh, economics uh, and, and fiscal policy. 60, 70 people in the room. Robert, Robert Smith was there. Diddy was there. Chairman Horsford. You had the NAACP, Eric, you know, Derek Johnson, Martin Morrell, Raymond Sharpton, Black Economic Alliance, Black Economic Forum, all these groups. We met in October. My whole deal is, it's March. Nothing has happened. Uh, and so um, we have to have, I, I just fundamentally believe, action uh, to be able to begin to change these numbers to access those dollars to change our community, to change our businesses. Absolutely. And one of the things that we have tried to do, and for example, on the municipal front, when we talk about city budgets, um, is really walking people through the process to understand how close they actually are and how they do have the ability to have impact on city budget. So we've had cities where they came, where individuals from the community came in and said, this is what we envision, this is what we need, and have put, put forth line by line in a budget, here's how we allocate funding from this to that. That same rationale exists, I think, also in the corporate sector. One is to to remove the myth of the distance between people on the ground in their communities and what these corporations are doing. That there is a benefit to collective action when we have put uh, certain companies, for example, in the crosshairs, whether to be for to, to protest them, but also to expose what it is that they're doing, right, which is very important. But there's work that we have to do at the ground level to educate people and to handhold to show this is actually what it looks like 
this is the, some of the numbers that you uh, set forth. And here's how we can actually tangibly reallocate or push these companies to do what they said that they were going to do. So there have been some instances in 2020. I know um, J.P. Morgan Chase, which is not the best example, but when some of that on the ground work was taking place and we showed that they lent more to one predominantly white community in Chicago than to all of Chicago's black communities combined. Then they started, they made some shifts and created new programming and things of that nature, right? So it's it's an example of the kinds of pressure that is necessary for these corporations. And we, as folks on the ground, as organizers in our communities, not believing that there's so much distance between the kind of change that we can get if we apply pressure and if we are very clear and specific on the ways that those funds should be allocated and have some understanding of how corporations are actually using those funds so that we can propose the alternatives to them. It's not just enough to say we need more resources. We have to be, we have to clearly articulate what we need and for what purpose and then hold the, the corporations accountable to that. I also, I think, last question here, I also believe that what has to happen is uh, the education piece. Because, you know, what I experience constantly, even with this show, a lot of our folks don't even understand how the dots are connected. Uh, and so when we're talking about public policy, we're talking about who's in control of budgets, things along those lines, you know, you got these people who are saying, man, Democrats ain't nothing, Republicans ain't nothing, I'm getting down to politics. And I'm sitting there going, um, that's where the money is. So you can sit here and say, I'm getting out of politics, but that makes no sense because who controls city services, county services, school district, uh, who controls state services and federal? We're talking about, again, trillions of dollars. The last thing black folks can do is check out of a political process, because when you do that, you're checking out of the economic process. Absolutely. I mean, the politics fundamentally is about who's getting what. And so the people who are in the game or who are at the table will largely make the decisions about how resources are allocated and to whom. And so we actually have additional responsibility because we know that for so long those who are at the table implemented and instituted policies that would deliberately exclude black people. And we can run down the history of that, whether it's redlining, whether it's just looking at local procurement budgets and which uh, are black vendors getting access to procurement opportunities in your local city, right? So we have an additional responsibility because we know that those who've been at those tables have largely intentionally excluded our people. And if we check out of the process, then we actually have no way of influencing the decisions that are made, particularly around how budgets are developed and how uh, resources are allocated. Where can people access the six-part series? So they can find the six-part series on Nonprofit Quarterly's website. If you just type in Vision for Black Lives, uh, Economic Policy Agenda, any of those keywords, you will see all of the articles. Again, we talk about operations. Uh, we talk about guaranteed basic income. We talk about housing, the lack of affordability. We talk about the wealth gap. Black uh, households, 24 cents to every uh, white, to every dollar for white households. These are very real, affecting our, our community. So we encourage folks, Vision for Black Lives Economic Policy Agenda. You can also learn more at m4bl.org, where we have the Vision for Black Lives, our, our robust policy agenda for black people, and folks can read it and, and digest it. And especially in this political climate, where we have to articulate what we want, not just say what we don't want, but clearly articulate what we want and a pathway to get there, just really want to encourage folks to, uh, to check it out and to continue to follow us on all platforms. All right, Dr. India. We appreciate it. Thanks a lot. So much. All right, folks, we'll talk about this with our panel when we come back right here on Roller Martin Unfiltered on the Black Star Network. I have something I want to tell you. I am running for president of the United States. Holy. I'm paving the road for a lot of other people looking like me to get elected. Brooklyn's first black representative. You're about to make history. You want to be president? You ain't no man. Maybe we should find your mother. All you got is your one vote. You sound just like every other politician. Do I look like every other politician? Freedom! Truly, 
you can't win. And why can't I win? I have an opportunity to make a difference. This isn't a campaign. It's a joke. The only thing anybody's going to remember is that there were a bunch of black folks who made fools of themselves. I'll kill you! See too much suffering. And I don't know how to not try. We're living it proud. I don't think I'm special. I just want to remind people what's possible. We need something that's going to make some noise. The Black Panthers and Shirley Chisholm. It's like thunder and lightning. I'm going to force all the politicians to be held accountable. You gonna do all that? School teacher from Brooklyn. Harriet was just a slave. Rosa was just a domestic. What is it you do for a living again? Essence Atkins. What's the love king of R&B, Raheem Devon? It's me, Sherry Shepard, and you know what you watch. You're watching Roland Martin, Unfiltered. Folks, my pal, Dr. Julian Malvo, President Emerita, been in college, economist and author, joining us out of Washington, D.C., Derek Jackson, Georgia State Representative out of Atlanta, Teresa Lundy, Principal Founder of TML Communications out of Philadelphia. Julian, I want to start with you again uh, as an economist. Let's, let's talk about the money. I mean, the, the thing here <clears throat> is that what they're doing here is great shining a light. It's great sort of unpacking this. But the audience has to understand the money game. I always say, if you're not having a money conversation, you're not having an American conversation. And so what people have to begin to understand is that when we talk about how do you change the money, um, you, you have folks who are advocating for reparations. You see what's happening in California. You see what's happening in New York. Obviously, efforts on the federal level. That's a long, long process there that uh, folks have been fighting for for decades and centuries. What you also have right now, you have budget allocation. How money is being spent city level, state, county level, state level, school district, federal level. Then you have the money that's in uh, public-private partnerships. Then you have the money that's coming from corporate America. And the, from a leverage standpoint, what we have is the ability to challenge, call out folks, but also withdraw. <clears throat> now, the King talked about this April 3rd, 1968. So what black folks are going to have to understand, as long as we are willing to keep buying products, they have no incentive to change. As long as we are not voting at a maximum of our voting power, they do not have an incentive to change. People really need to understand if we are voting at 65, 70, 75, 80, 85 percent, that will scare the hell out of folks on the local, state, national level. And then you're going to see a change in how dollars are being allocated. Well, you're absolutely <laughs> right about that and about so many other things around this issue. One of the things I mean, I found the young ladies uh, conversation um, obviously making great points, movement for black lives does great work, but I found it specious from this perspective. As, as you said and pushed her on, where are the concrete steps? If anybody, NAA, well, they probably can't do it, they get sued, but some black organizations said, we're going to boycott X, whatever X is, for 30 days, one 30 days, they would feel it and they would respond. So we have become so very timid. You're right. Dr. King talked about economic withdrawal. 
We talk about strategically withdrawing from cooperating with those who are oppressing us. And we have, we have the rhetoric, and then some folks shilly-shally back to very same stores, very same companies that have been oppressing us. And these companies are very great at window dressing. So many of them have a DEI person or a black person in charge or whatever, and they throw, you know, a mill here, a mill there for something. But let's remember that in the wake of the assassination, the murder of George Floyd, $50 million went on the table of corporations who said they were going to do this, they were going to do that. Two things about that. One was just ultimately self-serving. Those banks who said they were going to provide more mortgages, well, that's not free money. And you're going to get interest. So that, that's just whatever. But secondly, of the money that was put on the table, probably only uh, five million of it really went to black organizations like the Urban League and AA. And much of it has not, it was pledged, but it was not realized. And so I find these, you know, from an economic perspective, or my economic perspective, I find these conversations very frustrating. It, I mean, it would even, they could put out, let's boycott. Let me say McDonald's, for want of a better word. Uh, and I'm not picking on McDonald's. They're, you know, Fortune 500 companies, Fortune 50 companies. But let's just say that somebody said, let's do that for a month. They would feel it. And the whole issue is not that they don't feel rhetoric. They don't care about rhetoric. But when, it, when the bottom line is affected, they care about that. And, that. and again, that's why the voting issue is also so important, because we're not at we're nowhere near max. I don't know that we've ever gotten up to 70 in national elections. But if we were, again, we could be influence public policies in different kind of ways. So I applaud what they're doing. I couldn't find their report. Got on very our close. Hmm? Well, Julian, we got very close. We got very close to that number uh, with Obama, uh, but but the thing that I am trying, and, and again, I, like I, you know, again, I, I think that what we have, what we have here, um, and I'm gonna go to Derek. What we have here is there are a lot of people who say, "I'm frustrated. Things are not being done." Totally understand it, but I then go, "Okay." But being frustrated and checking out of the process simply is not the answer. If there is a guaranteed way you're not going to get anything is when you check out of the process. <clears throat> and so what we have is we have a lot of frustration, a lot of anger, a lot of people who are who feel as if nothing is being done. If you are not organized and mobilized, to become difference makers, nothing is going to get done. I am speaking as somebody who is the son of two of parents who were founders of a civic club who said, we want to change our community. My parents didn't go to college. Most of the people who were in the civic club, they weren't college educated, but they cared enough about the community. What they did was they used people power. They understood, okay, fine, okay, we want to fix that. Okay, who's over that? Who controls that? Council person, county commissioner, member of Congress. Uh, and so they did it. But it wasn't one or two individuals. They actually got together to make it happen. I, I, just, I, I just think that we have a lot of people in our community who are complaining about things. But we have to understand, as long as we are not mobilized and not organized, nothing is going to change when it comes to accessing the money. You know, Roland, that's the reason why you see right now a lot of state houses, and I'm here in Georgia, where the government is going after uh, their constituents. They, they prevent them from protesting. Um, they don't want to be heard by their constituents. And they want our constituents to be checked out of the process for the very point you're making. Here, listen, let's, let's, let's make this real. Here in Georgia, we're sitting on a $16 billion surplus, Roland, surplus. Mm. That means we're going to pay all of our bills, and we're sitting on a $16 billion surplus. And so I'm a co-sponsor of a reparation bill, House Bill 955. And one of the things that we're asking is say, hey, you're sitting on this $16 billion surplus. 
how much are you going to allocate for those that are black and brown communities? And let's have a real conversation. Because the thing that you're also highlighting too, Roland, is this. Who has the largest pocketbook or wallet uh, on the planet? The federal government and the state government. We, we have the largest wallet. And so we have a wallet larger than any corporation. So if we do not exercise our First Amendment right and talk to our government at the federal, state, and local levels to say what our tax dollars should do for us, because we are taxpayers, then by us checking out a process, we are doing a disservice to our community. Uh, you know what, T T Teresa, I, here's what just is a perfect example. <clears throat> I get a kick out of these folks who love to comment on my social media. Man, uh, there you go begging money from the corporations. There you go begging money <clears throat> uh, from these campaigns. There you go begging money from the government. And then I go, don't your dumb ass know that you go where the money is? I mean, I forgot the who was the bank robber. They asked them, "Why do y'all rob banks?" They said, "That's where the money at." <laughs> <clears throat> right now, <clears throat> right now, there are media companies that not even right now. Last year, we're projecting, oh, we're going to have an increase of thirty, forty percent in revenue because we know we're going to get three to five hundred million dollars in political advertising. Mm -hmm. Why wouldn't black-owned media? want to get that money. There are people right now who are tapping into, who are raising millions of dollars through venture capital, private equity, and that money's coming from pension funds. People talk about Elon Musk. Elon Musk is the richest person in the world, not because he pulled himself up by his bootstraps. It's because he got government contracts. Uh -oh. Because he got tax subsidies. So when I hear these people yell and complain and bitch about the Congressional Black Caucus and, well, these black politicians, <clears throat> they not doing this, they not doing that. Do you know who calls them? Corporations looking for tax breaks, looking for tax incentives. Mm -hmm. When we look at right now, Teresa, city contracts, you're in Philadelphia. When I hear, look, you ain't moving contracts in Philadelphia unless you're dealing with black people. What's the number that we're getting? Our people are, ha are going to have to understand whining, complaining, yelling, screaming does not change the economic game. Voting, organizing, mobilize, putting pressure does. I don't know of anything black people have ever gotten in American history that we got just because. It was because we had to apply pressure. So what I was saying to the sister from the movement of black lives, I totally get shining a light on something. Ida B. Wells talked about that. We do that in media. They have to feel pressure in order to change the game. No, you're absolutely right. You know, when we, um, especially, you know, Roland, when you start getting on this topic, obviously it's near and dear to my heart because I do own a business. And the many conversations and the many contracts I've even received from the city of Philadelphia um, and other cities had to do with, um, you know, being a minority and a uh, subcontractor. And even, you know, that whole subcontracting process is something else than the same, but we also have to look at the percentage that they're trying to give minority businesses. Um, and, and there is conservative efforts to make sure the minority businesses are getting the contracts and that they are in the room and a part of the project. But part of it is it's always, you know, a very, very slim piece of the pie. And so I agree. Staying silent has never worked. Um, you know, being in the background and hoping that you can get to the next positions after you've stayed there for 20 and 30 years just doesn't work anymore. We have to really understand that truth to power really means understanding your network, understanding your net worth, and understanding your value. 
And the only way people understand those three things, if we activate it differently, that means speaking up, that means writing, that means asking others who look like you that is in that room, hey, by any chance, you know, what are you getting for, you know, this type of work? Um, because it is, you know, it's a conversation starter. But again, you also see the inequities of those that are in that position. I can go on and on. Teresa, while we wait for Roland, can I ask you what what um, has been the biggest um, contributor to your success uh, in terms of getting contracts, et cetera? Can you hear me? I can hear you. I don't know that the, the team can, but, you know, I, like I said, while we had a little dead air, just wanted to ask you a question about the biggest contributors yeah. to your success. Yeah, I think the biggest... So, sorry about that. I lost... Uh, sorry, I... Yeah, I lost. I lost one second. I lost video return there, uh, so um, um, sorry about that. Uh, so we got the technical glitch uh, fixed fixed out here. Teresa, can you hear me? Yes, I can. All right. I want to. I want to pick up on um, when you when you still open it. You said, uh, you know, as a small business owner, when we're talking about this money game, this is the problem that I keep having. I was on a phone call with an advertiser um, uh, uh, you know, two hours ago. But it also comes to capacity. So when people are talking about, man, black women are starting business at a faster rate than anybody else, absolutely correct. <laughs> but they're small. And so when we're talking about accessing the money, when we have the ability to access the dollars, when we have the ability to get the contracts, we now can go from one to three to five to 10 to 20 to 50 to 100. That changes the game. The problem is a lot of us are small. Uh, and so I, our people have to begin to understand that it's not just starting a business, it's building and growing a business and having capacity. Okay. Capacity is the number one uh, issue that small businesses have. Um, some of the things uh, that I've been recommending to people, you know, I, I think I started out with the whole employee method, you know, so that is everybody is getting on a W-2. Um, but remember, employers have to pay those taxes. So I think when you're starting out, one of the recommendations I would do is hire the crucial individual or individuals that can help grow it. Um, and then 1099 everybody else for special projects and, and everything else. Because once you start paying those employee taxes and other taxes therein, it gets a little steep. Um, but again, when we talk about capacity, that's one of the major things that, you know, contracts from local and state are looking at. You know, do you have 10 or more that can, you know, work on a three or five million dollar project? And if the answer is no, you're already uh, looked to the side. So, you know, in preparation for some of those big projects, you know, I always kind of go to those who've had the prime contract year after year um, and ask them, is there a way we can partner so we can also understand their system and figure out the best way that, you know, the next year when it comes for renewal, that we can also be in an opportunity to also uh be in that space to get that project because more than likely especially in the business that i'm in communications and public relations we don't need that many people so many people think it takes 20 um to do a message or a statement and really it could take five or six really good people that is focused on that project you well, know for uh, their hours and, and see julia I, I, julia i'm gonna i'm gonna stay there because i'm just i mean i'm just gonna go there and i think people need to understand this okay so Teresa has a public relations communications firm. So I'm just going to lay this out. Our black organizations, who are we employing? Mm -hmm. If it, the Image Awards was just, do, are they using a black PR firm? Hmm. If like we that. are, if we're building things, who, who are we using? See, I, well, see, I'm gonna start. See, here's, see, here's the old deal. It, it's like, again, when I address this issue with HBCUs, 
Okay. Mm -hmm. Who has the food service? Who has the food services contract on an HBCU campus? Mom. Who has the transportation contract? See, if we start, see, if we start going down this line. Come on. There are a lot of black organizations and a lot of black people and a lot of black companies who talk a good game about what we need, mm -hmm. but, they but never, they're mm -hmm. not doing what they're saying. Well, you know, the B2B so piece. If, if, so hold on, hold on one second, hold on one second, Julian. So what, here's what I'm trying to frame. We do not have a national black owned public relations firm. Well, that's because they're not getting the large monthly retainers. They then can't go out and hire 20, 30, 40, 50 people to service the contracts. So you got that. So now we start talking about sectors, construction, engineering, communications, transportation, catering. We could go on and on and on. The challenge has to be to black organizations, and we got a whole bunch of them, who are you hiring? Who are you using? I've said it. When we built the Black Star Network studio right there on 16th and K, the lighting, black lighting company. The control room, a black engineering company. The green screen is a black drape company. The set was built by a black set design company. We use black transportation companies. When we have events, we use black caterers. We're actually walking the walk. I'm telling you right now, Julian, and you know this as well, it's a lot of our organizations are not being proactive utilizing black businesses, but we love talking about the need to build and create wealth. You can't do it if we don't hire them. Go ahead. We have to uh, walk the walk that we talk. And I can give you example after example of how entrenched we are in the predatory capitalism that um, basically oppresses us. When I was president at Bennett College, one of the first things I did was look at our contracts to find that um, we didn't have that many contracts with black people. And when I went to change that, you would not believe or you would believe the backlash that I got from uh, the majority community in Greensboro because the college had been used to dealing with so-and-so and, -so and um, they, I, for my, my notion of let's change it was you're upsetting the apple cart. And I mean, I remember one time and we got so ridiculous some brothers came to see me to tell me that I could not do what I said I was going to do because the white people was their friends. And so I had one of my infamous Malvo meltdowns and uh, paid the price for it, of course, but and said, this, this BS is not going to walk. We are running around saying we want to empower black entrepreneurs. Remember, I started the first entrepreneurship program at Bennett. We want to empower black entrepreneurs, but we're not doing business with them. I just found out that one of our major Greek letter organizations is doing a survey. Um, and, you know, we do surveys, Terrence Woodbury does surveys. We have... They got a white firm uh, doing these surveys. I'm like, WTF? And wow. I, I was told, just keep your mouth shut. Why do you always have to start something? I'm like, because I was just born that way. But I could go down the list. Our major organizations are not, you know, the B2B is really important. So it's not only who the big organizations do business with, it's who does business, business with each other. Like I would hope, given what she talks about, that Teresa often works with other minority entrepreneurs. And I'm hoping that others do as well, because the B2B also becomes important. It, what you're doing becomes extremely important. And one thing I want to lift up, you know, we are all out in the street for our African countries. But one of the things, Roland, that works my nerves to the bone is how many of these countries have white-owned PR firms, white attorneys. Why they they come to us as African Americans, expecting us to advocate for them, but they don't spend money for us. I mean, money talks, and you know what walks. And basically, what we're seeing is the contempt that even many black people have for black-owned business. Just the utter contempt that we have, because when you walk by a brother to give some money. 
uh, Anna Sister, to give some money to a white man or woman, what you're saying is you don't matter. But then you're going to turn around. You're going to turn around on the minority business tip and try to get yourself another contract. I'm a minority business. Well, what are you doing with your minority business dollars? And for probably, I don't have a number, but I, I'd say 70 to 80 percent of black-owned businesses do not support black-owned businesses. And that includes our HBCUs, tragically. You know, you know, now, you know, you, right. You know, you, you know, Derek, I'll give a perfect example. Derek, uh, I remember in Illinois, that was, a, that was an initiative that was, um, they were trying to, the LGBT community was trying to defeat this initiative. Uh, and they kept coming to the black lawmakers. And one of the black lawmakers said, why is your whole lobbying team white? Mm-hmm. Y'all, y'all coming to the black legislators and your whole lobbying team white. They said, "Don't come back in here unless you got some black lobbyists." Okay. Now, that's a black politician. That's a black politician making it clear, y'all want our votes, but your whole team is white. We know the story when when Beyonce met with Reebok and walked in the meeting and the whole room was white. She walked out of the meeting. <laughs> I ain't doing business with y'all. Because how y'all going to disrespect me and y'all can't have anybody on the other side of the table looking like me? What we're talking about here is you've got to have black CEOs, black corporate execs, black politicians making demands and making it clear, no, I'm going to use my leverage, influence, and power to change the economic paradigm. And so if it means getting one black person hired, five black people hired, if it means making sure contracts are going to black people, I'm going to do that. So now if that begins to happen in many places with scale, overnight, mm -hmm. overnight we change the economic uh, paradigm. I, I said this here, Derek, but regarding PepsiCo. And I had Mark Morial on, and I told Mark, I said, PepsiCo Foundation has a five-year, $10 million initiative with the Urban League to stand up black-owned restaurants. Support it. PepsiCo has been running these commercials. They want to drive $100 million in receipts to black-owned restaurants over a period of five years. I support it. PepsiCo spends $3 billion a year on marketing, and they own a ton of stuff, $3 billion. If they spent, if they spent that 5% with black-owned media, that's $150 million a year. That's $750 million over five years. Which one of those three has a greater impact on black America? The five-year $10 million partnership with the Urban League, the $100 million in receipts to black restaurants that they can't track, or the $750 million to black-owned media. We've got to have, and, and I said this to the CBC, I said, the starting point, if y'all want to support black-owned media, I said to the CBC, start with every single one of those logos who sponsors the Congressional Black Caucus Foundation, ALC. All those companies, you, I said the CBC should go to them and say, are you committing a specific spend to black owned media of your marketing dollars. They should be saying, what are your black transportation contracts? PR, uh, audio visual, uh, catering, on and on and on. I said to the CBCF, I said to the CBC, I said this to the NAACP, to the Urban League, to all these groups, stop letting people come in and be on your boards and sponsor your events and you're getting a table check, but leaving billions on the table for black America. There, go ahead. You know, Roland, to the essence of your question, and what you're highlighting is, do we know our, our value and do we know our power? Because once we know our value and we know our power, we can affect change. Case in point, right here in Georgia, like I mentioned earlier, a $16 billion surplus. And so we're asking, hey, what are we going to do with this surplus? We're going to pay all our bills. And you're talking about um, doing more in the black and brown communities. We want to know what that is. Another way that we can address this, uh, right here in Georgia as well, we got over 400 lobbyists. 
Only of that 400, about 21 are black. And so here we sit in the largest black caucus in the nation. If we don't do something with this power and knowing our value and our worth, what good is it? The last point uh, to your point, Roland, is this. Uh, according to the, uh, the, uh, to the economists, the black community, just the black community, is $1.8 trillion. That's how much our, that's what our spend is in the United States, $1.8 trillion. So we can support our own, we can uh, create our own, we can have Black Wall Street on steroids, but we got to get through the mindset that um, that we can do this with other black companies. We don't have yep. to be validated uh, absolutely. by white companies. Yep. There you go. There you go. Folks, hold, hold tight one second. Got to go to break. We'll be right back on Roland Martin Unfiltered on the Black Star Network. Support us in what we do. Join the Bring the Funk Fan Club. Send your ticket money order. P.O. Box 57196, Washington, D.C. 200-37-0196. Cash app, dollar sign, RM Unfiltered. PayPal, R. Martin Unfiltered. Venmo is RM Unfiltered. Zale, Roland at RolandSMartin.com. Roland at RolandMartinUnfiltered.com. We'll be right back. I'm Dee Barnes, and next on The Frequency, Beyonce has always been country. We're talking to music, pop culture, and politics writer Taylor Crumpton about her new article on Beyonce's new country songs and how country music has always been part of Black culture. Since the release of Texas Hold'em in 16 Carriages, there has been a definition of what black country music is and a definition of what white country music is. Mm -hmm. White country music historically has always won the awards, we've always got the certifications. Black country music has not. This is a conversation you don't want to miss. That's next on The Frequency on the Black Star Network. Next on The Black Table with me, Greg Carr. Democracy in the United States is under siege. On this list of bad actors, it's easy to point out the Donald Trumps, the Marjorie Taylor Greens, or even the United States Supreme Court as the primary villains. But as David Pepper, author, scholar, and former politician himself says, there's another factor that trumps them all and resides much closer to many of our homes. His book is Laboratories of Autocracy, a wake-up call from behind the lines. So these state houses get hijacked by the far right, then they gerrymander, they suppress the opposition, and that allows them to legislate in a way that doesn't reflect the people of that state. David Pepper joins us on the next Black Table here on the Black Star Network. It's John Murray, the executive producer of the new Sherry Shepard Talk Show. This is your boy, Irv Quake. And you're tuned in to Roland Martin Unfiltered. Welcome back. We've been covering a variety of stories that's been happening, uh, of course, on the international scene. So much attention has been on uh, Israel, uh, Hamas, Ukraine, uh, but but we know what's happening here uh, in Haiti, Nigeria, and some other countries. Uh, and so let's talk about what's happening in uh, Nigeria. Uh, they've actually made a decision that uh, has caught uh, a lot of folks uh, by attention, and that that deals with uh, the removal of United States troops. The government there uh, is breaking off with quote with immediate effect its military operations agreement with the United States. Uh, it is expected to risk uh, the U.S. counter terrorist uh, operations in West Africa. So, Asha Casimir Hernandez, national security and foreign policy expert, joins us right now. Uh, Asha, glad to have you here. Walk us through what does this actually mean? Uh, this is why, why are they taking this action? Yes, thank you so much for having me today. So since July 2023, when you saw a successful military coup happen orchestrated by the National Council for the Safeguard of the Homeland, um, that has pretty much complicated relations or the game changer of complicating relations with the United States and Niger. So you saw the successful coup that was pretty much fueled by 
terrorist groups, um, as well as populism that was in pursuit of ousting President uh, Bouzam. Then subsequently, you start to see where the relationship uh, went south, where United St where complicated uh, CT operations or counterterrorism operations for the United States, as well as humanitarian assistance, uh, providing humanitarian assistance to, to Niger. Then, uh, furthermore, you start to see in terms of European representation, there was French troops that were removed in December. And then just recently, there was a uh, uh, visit a U.S. delegation that visited Net Niger, and uh, as a result of that meeting, the uh, Niger officials accused the United States of, 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 of having some sort of relations with Russia as well as Iran on some deal with u uranium reserves. So, um, uh, subsequently, you start you. Uh, the Niger, um, excuse me, the coup or the, uh, the military junta pretty much came out and said that the uh, delegation uh, disrespected him by accusing him of the secret deal with Iran and Russia. And then they also mentioned that with this current status force agreement, that it's represent a uh, representation of being unconstitutional, where the people of Niger do not want U.S. troops located because it does not represent the interests of, of the people there. So that's the developments, and it definitely was a game changer since July 2023. My understanding that we have a major drone base in Niger? Yes. And so that is it. Niger has, uh, since 2016, been a strategic location for the United States to conduct uh, CT operations, mainly drone operations, uh, conducting surveillance uh, ops as well. So this is definitely a hit for uh, providing security assistance uh, to our Niger, um, to Niger, as well as the rest of the sub-region of West Africa. Uh, so what we're seeing as far as a potential solution is definitely in response to what happened recently, where you have the Secretary of Defense using diplomatic channels to try to secure troops there. Uh, we had over 1,100 troops um, uh, in uh, Niger conducting um, drone operation, um, drone missions there, as well as, um, well, just recently it has been reduced uh, to 648. But if we cannot be able to secure those true presence there, then we must look into possibly relo relocating them in uh, West Africa. But this is definitely an impact for Sahil, and we've been doing this since 2016. Questions from my panel. Uh, Derek, you first. So my question is around, uh, and being a retired Naval officer after serving 22 years in the Navy myself, and I've been in that in that region uh, for a couple of tours. Um, what's bringing this divorce on um, with some of our uh, allies? Is it because of the politics? The policies? What, what's, what's really spurring this on? Yes, thank you so much. So you start to see a rise of military coups happening in the United, um, excuse me, in the African continent, and definitely in uh, uh, in uh, Niger, and also amongst its neighboring countries. Uh, I mean, just Mali and and uh, Burkina Faso has experienced like more than four since 2020. So there's been an uptick of military coups happening, and as a result of that, has pretty much complicated. Uh, the relationships with the United States and many African countries. Then you're also seeing this as an example of the symptoms of strategic competition, where Russia is trying to undermine our relationships with uh, many countries in Africa. And this is one example where, uh, in response to what happened recently after uh, the, um, uh, the, uh, the uh, military junta announced that we are no longer have a security, um, we, w we want United States troops removed. They all then went on to say, we want to expand security, our security interests with Russia. So you're seeing where Russia and China, especially Russia, is undermining the security, um, security uh, relationships with the United States. Mm -hmm. is, that, is that because of Teresa. our position? Also, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. No, no, there, go ahead, go ahead. No, I was just saying because as we try to grow NATO more and how Russia is trying to prevent us from growing NATO more, 
Um, do you see that also playing a front to this to this game of chess? Yes, absolutely. Um, again, during the era of strategic competition, you know, uh, it's it's imperative for Russia to grow its influences or presence around the world, especially in Africa. Africa is definitely a playground for them as far as growing their influences or just the overall global south. So you're seeing, just like what is mentioned in the United States national security strategy in 2021, you, they said in the next 10 years, you're going to see the intensity of strategic competition where Russia and China are going to double down as far as competing against the United States. In doing so, they're going to undermine our alliance system. And this is one clear example. Teresa. Yeah. Um, well, one, thank you for that host of information. Uh, I actually had to read a few articles before I came on here to figure out the best question for you. One of my questions is, um, now that this has happened, uh, is, there, is this something that we'll see in the immediacy this year? I know they're getting removed now, but is there because I haven't seen anything from the White House really make a statement about this, and I'm not really sure why. Um, but is this something that's going to happen uh, this year that's really that we're going to see the effect of it, since apparently this is happening in other countries? Uh, well, yes, there is a possibility. But as far as what the White House is saying, they're using diplomatic channels. Uh, uh, National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan, along with Secretary of Defense Austin, mentioned that they're trying really hard to work very closely uh, to uh, secure a quick decision on making sure that we have troop presence there. Uh, but again, because this is a strategic competition, this is harder to do right now uh, with these uh, with our allies and partners in the African continent. So some of our decision makings, we don't end up with our desired outcomes because of the fact that it's, it's being more contested uh, through Russia and China. So, But the best thing is to right now maintain diplomatic channels and ensuring that we have, we maintain our presence there and c continue to conduct CT operations as well as providing humanitarian assistance. Julian. Um, I was in Zambia in uh, July, and it was very clear to me the um, Chinese influence on the African continent. I mean, much of the new construction that was taking place in Lusaka, you know, the signs were Chinese symbols, um, et cetera. We do not do what we used to do in terms of foreign aid, and yet China is picking up uh, their aid uh, on the African continent, and especially, uh, as is uh, Russia. What does help us with the economics? Should the United States be doing more to, to maintain these strategic alliances? Are we allowing China to ellipse us? Even as they're having their own economic, you know, we cut foreign aid because we we have a different mindset. We cut foreign aid off and we say, well, how, why do we give all this money to X when we could be using it at home? Um, you don't get that same situation in other places. So help me with the economics of this. Is, is, are there economic drivers to this withdrawal? Yes. Thank you so much So for that question. And I, I, I really uh, admire your your uh, perspective on economics. So thank you so much for asking us. Well, that is the main domain right now where China has been able to uh, secure a lot of economic techno opportunities or deals with African countries, since, especially since the existence or the start of the Belt and Road Initiative, where they built a lot of infrastructure projects within the African continent. Uh, so there's been a lot of investments when it comes to eco economic tech deals. Now, what in terms of United States involvement in in Africa, especially when it comes to economics, because we have been so engaged uh, from twenty uh, uh, since two thousand one in terms of post nine eleven all the way up until two thousand and eighteen involvement with with the Middle East and other parts of the world, we have lost the finger on the pulse in terms of trying to do more in Africa because we prioritize other sub regions. So now you're seeing. Africa, I mean, excuse me, China has been able to come in, eat up all the potential economic deals. And then since the uh, outcome of the African Leadership Summit, now we're engaged in the in the continent, but 
but with limitations because a lot of deals have been eaten up by the Chinese. So we're kind of like more reactionary. And I mean, it's really sad. I actually saw a news clip like prior to us hosting the African Leadership Summit in, two, uh, in 2022, end of 2022. Prior to that, we had more focus on Africa since the, the during the Bush administration. So they had to go like all the way that, like 20 years later, say, wow, we're, re we're finally reinvigorating our interests uh, in Africa. And unfortunately, a lot of those e economic deals have been eaten up by the Chinese. All right, Ben. Well, Asha, we certainly appreciate it, uh, and we'll see what happens uh, next uh, with the folks in Niger. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Coming up next, Supreme Court. Here's a case, folks, when it comes to misinformation on social media. Uh, we will talk about that next on Roland Martin Unfiltered on the Black Star Network. I have something I want to tell you. I am running for president of the United States. Holy. I'm paving the road for a lot of other people looking like me to get elected. Brooklyn's first black representative. You're about to make history. You want to be president? You ain't no man. Maybe we should find your mother. All you got is your one vote. You sound just like every other politician. Do I look like every other politician? Truly, you can't win. And why can't I win? I have an opportunity to make a difference. This isn't a campaign. It's a joke. The only thing anybody's going to remember is that there were a bunch of black folks who made fools of themselves. I see too much suffering. And I don't know how to not try. Willie! I think I'm special. I just want to remind people what's possible. We need something that's going to make some noise. The Black Panthers and Shirley Chisholm. It's like thunder and lightning. I'm going to force all the politicians to be held accountable. You're going to do all that. I'm a school teacher from Brooklyn. Harriet was just a slave. Rosa was just a domestic. What is it you do for a living again? Marie Payton, voice of Sugar Mama on Disney's Louder and Prouder Disney Plus, and I'm with Roland Martin on Unfiltered. All right, folks, welcome back to Roland Martin Unfiltered. The Supreme Court Justice is it today. I heard arguments about the dispute with Republican-led states over how far the federal government can go to combat uh, uh, controversial social media uh, posts like COVID-19, national security, and others. This could, of course, uh, say for a lot when it comes to the issue of free speech. Isosa Osu, uh, the founder and CEO of Onyx Impact, an organization uh, created to fight harmful information um, um, targeting black communities, joins us now from Atlanta. Glad, glad to have you here. Here. Um, what we have, Isosa, here, you've got, um, for instance, in Virginia and Texas, you've got uh, them putting age uh, restrictions on, let's say, accessing porn material. You've got other states banning um, access to TikTok and other apps. You've got, um, I mean, you've got all these measures that are going on. Uh, under the guise of government uh, protecting uh, teens. But the question is still the people are posing like, wait a minute, who are you to impose these restrictions on individuals using uh, these sort of apps? Is that what's at the heart of the Supreme Court uh, case? So much for, for having me today, Roland. And um, 
I think I think what we're seeing here is that this lawsuit appears to be a far right strategy to weaponize the First Amendment and to weaponize disinformation. And it will have a direct negative impact on our ability to protect black voters and black election workers in 2024. And so when you're looking so at- So unpack that, how so? Un- unpack it, how so? How, what, what type of misinformation uh, they're hoping to allow? So how did this case come to be? We had two attorney generals from, from very red states team up with five conservative pundits and activists claiming that their posts were being taken down by social media companies at the behest of the U.S. government uh, because they seem to be inaccurate and misleading. They went to uh, conservative courts to uphold this, and a very conservative court, the Fifth, the Fifth Circuit, actually threw out most of the case. The remaining parts of the case are what was being argued today in front of the Supreme Court. And today, today the Supreme Court seemed incredibly unhappy with the way the case had been framed. They seemed incredibly dubious about the blanket First Amendment claims being brought before it. And so the Supreme Court should see through um, what is, at this point, a blatant fear campaign uh, that's being brought before them and throw out the case for, for a host of different reasons. But the problem is that so much damage has already been done at the local level, at the state level, at the national level. This There's been an um, incredible chilling effect that this litigation has had on all sorts of very important parts of our democracy. Let's just talk about elections and, and false statements about the election. State and local officials have been basically um, a lot of them have been cut off from social media platforms, from communicating about what they're seeing and um, how we can help and combat the the problematic content that uh, we saw. And we, in, in previous cycles, we had seen how this false content, these false um, uh, uh, election lies, led directly to disinformation campaigns against black voters led directly to harassment campaigns against black election officials. And right now, any communication is is essentially being um, stymied. And again, we're just seeing this, this fear campaign that's um, being driven by this litigation strategy that's um, just creating an America that's not um, where I think a lot of us want to live. Well, and, and what we're seeing is that in, in, in the, the, what used to be the mainstay of old were robocalls. So what they're now saying is, wait a minute, how can they know how vital social media is? And so this is the next uh, frontier uh, in this battle. They want to be able to say whatever the hell they want to say. It was like the argument they used uh, when it came to uh, Facebook and Twitter banning Trump. Well, because he's a candidate, he should be able to say whatever he wants. Not when it's put out lying and misinformation. Exactly, exactly, Roland. And when you look, when you think about it, our government has a responsibility. It has a duty to ensure free and fair elections. And when you're seeing inauthentic persuasion campaigns, uh, AI images targeting black voters, when you're seeing as you pointed to, false robocalls um, to black voters, foreign dissuasion campaigns imitating black activists like we saw in 2016. At the end of the day, if we're not allowed to set up to protect ourselves, we're just putting black voters at risk and we're putting our democracy at risk. Questions from the panel. Teresa, you first. Yeah, well, thank you so much for giving us a high-level overview. Um, one, I find it disturbing, but I'm also very curious on what some of the big, um, the big media uh, individuals like Facebook and um, LinkedIn, what they have to say about it. Has they have any? Had they had any input um, on this particular decision? Um. So. <laughs> Social media companies are. Uh, I would say that they're they're taking. They seem to be taking a a posture of um, passiveness to this particular uh, to this particular case. But the social media companies cannot pretend as if there's no link between false claims um, about the elections and the political violence and harassment that we saw against Black election workers and and uh, uh, voters in the 2024 uh, or in the previous elections. We 
social media companies need to be held to account before, during, and after elections for their their role and responsibility for the for the content that's spreading on their platform. They're making billions of dollars off of our information and refusing to share any of theirs, no matter how um, much harm is shown, no matter how often um, we see negative impacts. And so I think that there is a uh, uh, a lack of accountability that really has to be um, uh, studied and, and pushed back on from the from social media companies right now. Julian, thanks for giving us an update on or just an exp explanation of how this got to court. Because I think when I first read about, I'm like, how did this even get there? to the Supreme Court. My question, I mean, I'm, you mentioned the black election workers and the two sisters in, who were, they were harassed, but somebody put their information out so that people knew where they lived, what their phone number was. They were getting all kinds of threats. Would this case amplify or diminish people's ability to do that kind of thing? Uh, this case would amplify people's ability to what you're calling is called is called doxing. It's pushing, putting out people's personal information so that they can be harassed um, online. And there are uh, certain guidelines that some companies, some social media companies, try to uh, push back on, but uh, they are unbelievably loose, and they they didn't protect Ruby Freeman and Shea Moss, right? And so if you're if you're in a situation where you're pr trying to where there's a case that protects the amplification of disinformation, uh, this is a definite, and you're, and it chills the ability for local and state election officials to talk to the government about what they're saying. Uh, it will 100% um, lead to uh, situations where these types of disinformation campaigns, harassment campaigns, are far more likely, and we know who those harassment campaigns tend to target the most. Derek? You know, my question is around accountability. I would have thought after Fox News lost uh, the lawsuit and having to pay $787 million, that was enough accountability to tell both uh, networks and social media that you will, help, you will be held accountable. But what we're seeing now are all these state legislatures while the Supreme Court is, you know, dealing with this case at, at that level, uh, right here in Georgia, as you well know, last week we just passed a bill that it's a Republican-led legislature. They said it's okay for misinformation and disinformation to be done as long as it is not done within 90 days of an election day. I truly asked, the, yours truly asked the question, well, wait a minute. Um, that doesn't mean the misinformation and disinformation is going to just evaporate within 90 days of the election. What can we do to hold these state legislatures accountable while the Supreme Court get their business in order? We absolutely, this is such a great point, we absolutely need to be more proactive on the um, state and local level. But because what we're seeing is social media companies uh, across the country passing uh, uh, state legislation to make sure that they have as, as little accountability as possible. And so we need to be aware when these types of bills come up and we need to push back on it. Because at the end of the day, what we're seeing across the country, across the world, is that the cost of spreading disinformation is, is approaching zero, uh, with some bad actors actually being paid to, to spread disinformation. While the cost the cost of accessing truth is becoming more and more expensive as you get to, to, to paywalls, as, as trusted messengers become harder and harder to find, as you need subscriptions to different um, types of, of information. And so we're really at a an inherent disadvantage. And so some of the things that we need to do, uh, one of the things we need to do uh, as far as, as uh, the black community and black voters go is we need to invest so much more in black media. Uh, it's such a critical news source. It's such a trusted messenger for black communities across the nation. I think there was a Pew study that said that 64% of black people are turning to black outlets for their um, information. And so if we want to, we need to arm 
black media with the resources they need to be able to continue to, to do what y'all are doing here, push good information to our community so that we know, so that we have some type of, of, of pushback against what is essentially a zero-cost um, uh, campaign to spread disinformation. Uh, indeed, uh, indeed. Well, it's, it's a lot uh, that's going, uh, and trust me, the folks on the right, uh, you know, they, they see, uh, you know, what's next uh, in terms of uh, the horizon, and I think they were hopeful uh, that a conservative Supreme Court was going to allow them to do what they want to do. So uh, hopefully that gets stopped. So, so we certainly appreciate it. Thanks a lot. Thank you so much for having me. Folks, go to a break. We'll be back. Roland Martin on the filter on the, on the Black Star Network, broadcasting live from Los Angeles. Don't forget to support us in what we do. Uh, be sure to first join our Bring the Funk fan club. The goal is to get $20,000 fans contributing on average 50 bucks each. That's $4 to 19 cents a month, 13 cents a day. Uh, it's going to fund all of our efforts. And so send your check and money order to P.O. Box 57196, Washington, D.C., 20037 0196. Cash App, Dallas Side, RM Unfiltered. PayPal, R. Martin Unfiltered. Venmo is RM Unfiltered. Zale, rolling at rollingsmartin.com. Rolling at rollingmartinunfiltered.com. Be sure to download the Black Start Network app available. Apple phone, Android phone, Apple TV, Android TV, Roku, Amazon Fire TV, Xbox One, Samsung, Smart TV. We'll be right back. Muhammad, live from L.A., and this is The Culture. The Culture is a two-way conversation. You and me, we talk about the stories, politics, the good, the bad, and the downright ugly. So join our community every day at 3 p.m. Eastern and let your voice be heard. Hey, we're all in this together, so let's talk about it and see what kind of trouble we can get into. It's The Culture, weekdays at 3, only on the Black Star Network. Get Wealthy with me, Deborah Owens, America's Wealth Coach, less than 5% of the top executive positions in corporate America are held by women of color. We know it's not because of talent. A recent study says that it's microaggressions, unconscious bias, and limited opportunities being offered to women of color. On our next show, we're gonna get incredible advice from Francine Parham, who's recently written a book sharing exactly what you need to do to make it up into the management ranks and get the earnings that you deserve. I made a point to sit down and I made a point to talk to people. And I made a point to be very purposeful and thought provoking when I spoke to them. That's right here on Get Wealthy, only on Black Star Network. Hello, I'm Paula J. Parker. Judy Proud on The Proud Family. Louder and Prouder on Disney Plus. And you're watching Roland Martin Unfiltered. President Joe Biden, Vice President Kamala Harris held a Women's History Month celebration today at the White House. The president signed an executive order dealing with the issue of women's health. Here are their remarks. My name is Joe Biden. I'm Joe Biden's husband. Folks, happy Women's History Month. 
I'm smart enough to know that when you have Jim, Jill, Kamala, and Maria, and all of you, the most powerful, accomplished women in the room, all at once, is I just should hush up, as my mom said, and leave. <laughs> but all kidding aside, just let me say this. Yesterday was St. Patrick's Day here at the White House. Today is Women's History Month, Women's History Month. Two of the best days of the year, back to back. <laughs> The late Irish poet E. Van Bolen wrote, I've learned my name. I rise, I rose up, I remembered it, and now I can tell my story. It was different from the story told about me. End of quote. That poem entitled Mother Ireland, but she captures the spirit of women's history in America as well. And, uh, you know, in your own way, all of you are generations of women before you have risen up, shown your power, and told your story. It's made all the difference in the world in telling the full story of America. We're the only nation in the world divided and defined. defined. Every other nation is defined based on geography or, or ethnicity. We're the only nation based on an idea. Think about it. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all women and men are created equal, endowed by, etc. Treated equally our whole lives are supposed to be. We've never fully lived up to that, we, but we never walked away from it either. But Jill and I, Kamala and Doug, and the entire administration have never walked away from it either, especially when it comes to women. To state the obvious, women are half the population and underrepresented across the board, but not in my administration. <laughs> Say to say the truth, all the women in our family are brighter than all the men, so it's not hard to decision. <laughs> We're proud to have an administration that looks like America, with more women serving in senior positions than any time in American history. Our, our historic vice president, who's doing an incredible job. By the, way. <laughs> the cabinet and staff at every level across the administration, including military women, have gotten confirmed for two four-star generals to lead combat, combat commands. <laughs> The second and third women in history to do so, as well as the first woman ever to be on the Joint Chiefs of Staff. It matters. Together, we put the first black woman on the United States Supreme Court. And I'm mildly prejudiced, but I think she's the brightest person on the court. <laughs> and more black women on the Federal Circuit Courts of Appeals than all previous presidents combined. Together, we made historic progress through one of the toughest periods our nation has ever been through. Folks, and uh, as Jill just talked about, we've launched the first ever White House Initiative in Women's Health Research to pioneer the next generation of scientific research and discovery in women's health. Think of all the breakthroughs we've made in medicine across the board, but women have not been the focus. Research has been taken much too long to get to you all. I've called on Congress, as we've said, I'm repeating myself here, $12 billion for that effort. And today, today we're jump-starting that investment by dedicating $200 million to the National Institute of Health to tackle some of the most pressing health problems facing women today. With the executive order I'm about to sign, I'm directing the most comprehensive set of executive actions ever taken to improve women's health, ever taken. And I'm going to ensure that women's health is integrated and prioritized across the entire federal government. It's not just in women's health not just at NIH, the National Science Foundation, the Defense Department, the Environmental Protection Agency. I mean, across the board, this is really serious. And I will spearhead new research and innovation for breakthroughs in a wide range of women's health needs and that they experience throughout your, you experience throughout your lives. Because it really matters. It matters. Because we're focused on supporting women together, our administration has turned around the economy. Because we focused on women, by the way. Focused on women. We've achieved a lot. Greetings, everyone. Greetings and happy Women's History Month. <laughs> to our incredible President Joe Biden, who, of course, we all know as a tireless fighter for the safety and well being of women. To our First Lady, Dr. Jill Biden, who is a long standing, lifelong champion for women's health and women's health research to the first, second gentleman of the United States, my husband, Doug Emhoff. 
who's been a powerful advocate for gender equity, and to the members of our administration and all the extraordinary leaders, and I'm going to come to Maria later, um, <laughs> it is an honor to be with all of you. So this month and every month, we honor the women who shaped our nation and our world through their vision, courage, determination, and incredible skill, and upon whose broad shoulders we all stand. So as many of you know, my mother was a scientist. And when she began her career, only 7% of science and engineering PhD graduates were women. And even fewer, of course, were women of color. My mother had two goals in her life, to raise her two daughters, my sister Maya and me, and to end breast cancer. And because of the fact that our mother never asked anyone permission to pursue her dreams, Within one generation, I stand before you as the first woman vice president of the United States. Thank you. President, I have traveled to 20 countries in every hemisphere in the world, and I believe the measure of the strength of a democracy is measured based on the standing of its women. Yes. <laughs> President Joe Biden and I then have been very intentional, and he's been an extraordinary leader of our country, in ensuring that we do all that we can to lift up the status of the women of our nation including their economic status, understanding, of course, that when you lift the economic status of women, families benefit, communities benefit, and all of society benefits. And so with that knowledge, we have taken on issues like student loan debt, understanding women carry nearly two-thirds of all student loan debt, two-thirds. And we have canceled nearly $138 billion in student loan debt for almost 4 million Americans and counting, an average of more than $30,000 per person, and for public servants, including our teachers, of whom more than 70% are women. <laughs> one quarter of this stage. <laughs> and for those who are in public service, like our teachers, we have forgiven an average of over $60,000 in student loan debt. <laughs> to lift up the economic status of women, we have also invested in women entrepreneurs and small business owners. Across our nation, millions of women want to start or grow a business, but don't necessarily have access to the capital that allows them to do that. So building on work that I did with many of you in the United States Senate and under the leadership of our president, we have now invested billions of dollars to expand access to capital for women entrepreneurs. <laughs> to lift up the status of women, we have lowered the cost of health care. In particular, the cost. In particular, the cost of insulin for our seniors. What many of the leaders here know is that a fifth, one-fifth of women over the age of 65 have diabetes, and far too many have had to make the choice between either being able to afford to fill their prescription or fill their refrigerator. We also know seniors who are women are 80% more likely to live in poverty. So the president and I and our administration capped the cost of insulin for our seniors at $35 a month. <laughs> But even as we lift up the women and all people of our nation, there are those who are intent on dragging us backward. At this moment in states across our nation, we are witnessing a full-on attack against hard-fought, hard-won freedoms and rights, including the right of women to make decisions about their own body and not have their government tell them what to do. Today in America, one in three women of reproductive age live in a state with an abortion ban. 
Since Roe was overturned, I have met women who have had miscarriages in toilets because they were refused care. Women who went to an emergency room to receive care and were rejected because the health care providers there thought they would be sued and potentially sent to jail if they administered care. And it was only when she developed sepsis that she received care. Just last week, I visited a clinic in Minnesota where I met with medical professionals, courageous and dedicated women who provide critical health care and who see, like we all do, clinics across our country which have been closing and forced to close, leaving millions of women without access to essential, everyday, life-saving care. So, in conclusion, I'll just say this. There is so much at stake in this moment. And we each face a question. What kind of country do we want to live in? Do we want to live in a country of liberty, freedom, and rule of law, or a country of disorder, fear, and hate? Each of us has the power to answer that question. With our feet, with our voice, and with our vote. <laughs> so let us continue. Let us continue to fight for our freedoms. And as we know from our history, when we fight, we win. All right, folks, going to a break. We come back. Uh, the Department of Justice and Rights Division continues to do great work. We'll tell you uh, about uh, another person they're seeing the prison. We'll also recap this year's NAACP Image Awards. I was there uh, here in Los Angeles, and uh, we'll have more to say about that. You're watching Roland Martin Unfiltered right here on the Black Star Network. I have something I want to tell you. I am running for president. Of the United States? Holy. I'm paving the road for a lot of other people looking like me to get elected. Brooklyn's first black representative. You're about to make history. You want to be president? You ain't no man. Maybe we should find your mother. All you got is your one vote. You sound just like every other politician. Do I look like every other politician? Truly, you can't win. And why can't I win? I have an opportunity to make a difference. This isn't a campaign. It's a joke. The only thing anybody's going to remember is that there were a bunch of black folks who made fools of themselves. See too much suffering. And I don't know how to not try. Well, I think I'm special. I just want to remind people what's possible. We need something that's going to make some noise. The Black Panthers and Shirley Chisholm. It's like thunder and lightning. I'm going to force all the politicians to be held accountable. You're going to do all that. A school teacher from Brooklyn. Harriet was just a slave. Rosa was just a domestic. What is it you do for a living again? Charles, and I'm from Opelousas, Louisiana. Yes, that is Zodico capital of the world. My name is Margaret Chappelle. I'm from Dallas, Texas, representing the Urban Trivia Game. It's me, Sherry Shepard, and you know what you watch. Roland Martin on Unfiltered.
A former Tennessee correctional officer will be spending the next 15 months in prison uh, for in one year on supervised release for raping a female inmate and covering it up by falsifying reports. James Stewart Justice, a corrections officer with the Maury County Sheriff's Office, formerly known as James Stewart Thomas, was indicted in May 2022 and charged with falsifying records related to non-consensual sexual contact that he had with a female inmate in his custody. Frankly, he got off easy. He was facing 20 years in prison. I, I mean, this is this is quite bothersome to me, Julian, uh, that uh, you would have this uh, correctional officer uh, who would rape an inmate and all he gets is 15 months in prison. Roland, I agree with you. When I read about the case, I was horrified. He should be spending at least a decade in prison, and I'm not sure what kind of legal machinations took place. The flip side of that, however, is that very rarely are these folks charged with anything, and when they're charged, they don't stick because they, all these law enforcement people stick together. He has 15 months, and then he has a, a year of supervised probation. What ought to be added, at least to this, is that he can never saw, serve in a law enforcement capacity again, because as we know, they move jurisdiction to jurisdiction. He's already changed his name, and so you know he's setting himself up uh, for some form of reintroduction into law enforcement. But what little value, we just watched that so inspiring um, Women's History Month uh, reception at the White House with all our folks, you know, Kamala nailing it, President Biden doing just a brilliant job. We just watched that, and then we pivot to looking at the devaluation of a woman's body and a woman's life. 15 months for raping an inmate, just because she's an inmate does not mean she does not have rights. And so I find this progress on one hand outrageously disgusting on the other. Well, one of the things you hear, you, you see, Derek, I mean, this administration, and again, I, for the life of me, I don't know why they don't talk about it. Uh, they've spent a lot of time putting a lot of folks, corrections officers, wardens, and others in jail, again, they just never even bring it up. I don't get it. I don't yeah. get it neither, Roland. And the sad part is that you have a presumptive nominee for the Republicans who dehumanize individuals. And when you dehumanize individuals, when you see them less than a human being, uh, you can basically award folks, uh, depending on the pigmentation of their skin, uh, 15 months in jail for doing a very egregious um, act. I mean, let's face it. Listen, I'm, I'm a father. I've got four daughters and, and I got three sons. You know, when I think about where we are in our society and and we teach them right from wrong. Uh, we teach them uh, how to, you know, basically uh, approach everyone with a certain amount of grace and, mer and mercy and love uh, because they are someone's daughter. They are someone's uh, wife, uh, aunt, mother. And so when you see cases like this rolling, and then on the flip side, uh, when you see individuals who do something even less than that, they get 20 years, 30 years in, pre mm -hmm. in prison. That's the reason why a lot of uh, those of us in the black and brown community just think that there's two criminal justice systems. You know, Teresa, uh, the press release from the DOJ says, according to court documents, the defendant um, wrote an official report for the Maury County Jail in response to allegations that he had sexually abused uh, an inmate uh, he had guarded uh, in a hospital room uh, while the inmate recovered from major surgery. In his report, Justice uh, falsely claimed that he had reported to two Maury County jail supervisors that the inmate had made sexual advances towards him while the inmate was in his custody at the hospital. He falsely claimed that those two Maury County jail supervisors both advised him not to write a report about the inmate's alleged sexual advances and omitted a claim he later made to criminal investigators that he had a sexual relationship with the inmate after the inmate's release from custody. He was lying across the board.
forward. I mean, the reality is this here. Uh, that is, the DOJ can request a number of years. Not sure what the request was, but this is what the judge sentenced him to. So the judge could have sentenced him to sentence him to more years in prison. So this was the the judge's decision on sentencing. I'm sorry, this is abhorrent. 15 years, excuse me, 15 months in prison and one year of supervised release for raping an inmate. Inmates uh, have rights too. You're right. And for them to think that they don't um, is is just an understatement um, just for that person. I think there is a lot of issues with this case, you know, when um, people think you're, you're in jail uh, facing um, your sentence is also a death sentence. Uh, we know a lot of times the justice system gets it wrong, but you know when it feels like you know you are supposed to be doing a time for the crime you committed, that you know uh, other things are happening to you inside like it's supposed to happen. That's the problem, and I think that is where you know all these reform and advocacy organizations really need to step up and make sure it, it stops happening. Because those who feel like they have a pop, they have power um, over you will consistently do this unless we really um, find the need to, to put justice into action for us. Absolutely, absolutely. All right, folks, uh, we are here uh, in Los Angeles. It was a big weekend. It was the NLACP Image Awards taking place at the Shrine, and Queen Latifah was the host. It aired on CBS and BET. Uh, and uh, guess what? Vice President Kamala Harris made a cameo appearance. Not on this line. Thanks. Hey, Queen, I have a mission for you. Madam Vice President, you know I would do anything to serve, but I'm about to host the NAACP Image Awards. But that's why I called. You are the only person who can do this job. Okay. Well, off top, I can tell you I can get you some fresh Usher sweat about a pint. Food of the gods. I can get you some extra security. You know they clone Tyrone, right? Also, I got the hookup on a silk press. Now that's one assignment I have never misunderstood. I thank you for that. Listen, here's the thing. All I need you to do is remind people about how important this election is coming up in November. And if you can ask people to go to vote.gov to register to vote or to check their registration status, that would mean a lot. Oh, that's easy. You know I got you. Thanks, Queen. Have a great show. Lit, lit, period. Thank you. <laughs> I'm about to do this. Take care. You be safe. All right, during the show, uh, Queen Latifah uh, certainly uh, invoked Taraji P. Henson uh, in her fight for pay equity for actresses. Secret, we are facing some seriously pivotal issues. Everyone's talking about inflation. You know what's not feeling inflation? Equal pay for black actresses. <laughs> Thank you, Taraji, for standing up for all of us. You know what, Taraji, as a matter of fact, if you are a black actress in this room, would you please stand up? who have been representing for us. Support us. Join us. Because it's you who stand next to us every day. We know this. And we want to say thank you. Now you may sit down. Thank you so much. See, we're not alone. We are supported. Big night for Usher. He won Entertainer of the Year. He's also was presented with the President's Award uh, for his foundation work. Ooh, my heart is beating really, really fast. But it's good. It's, uh, it beats with passion. And um, I'm very honored to be able to receive this amazing award from the, from, from the depths of my soul, my passion uh, work. 
is what has mattered for me the moment my mother made me understand what purpose lies with the opportunity to be able to speak to the entire world. Um, I recognize her more than anybody. I know it's on the prompt of, hold on, don't move. I just wanted to say something before I started. But I wanted to make it known far too often in our industry do women, you know, um, not get the recognition that they truly deserve. And when we first started, it was even harder for a mother to believe in the dreams that I had because uh, I was unwavering being raised without a father uh, in our home, being raised as from a single parent, it was a lot. But she, um, she was more defined. If anyone deserves it more than anybody, it's her. Because the tenacity that it took to look within a male dominant industry and believe in your son unwaveringly and no matter how hard those boardrooms may have been. She didn't have the experience. Thank God she had Donald Passman in order to read his book and understand the industry. Uh, but because of that, I have this moment. So first and foremost, mom, even though I wrote you down in it, I want you to know how much I really love, appreciate, honor, recognize, appreciate you. Um, It is an incredible honor to be recognized by the NAACP in this beautiful community. All right, folks, uh, in one of the acting categories, uh, uh, Dames and Idris uh, won. Many people thought the other Idris was going to win. Uh, here is uh, his speech. Six years. Woo. Thank you, God. Uh, my mother, she um, she flew from Lagos, Nigeria, 17 hours to be here with me tonight. Before she got on a plane, she said, Damsey, if I come to Los Angeles, you better win. This award's been won by so many heroes of mine, James L. Jones, Michael K. Williams, Lawrence Fishburne. I'm honored to be standing amongst them. I'm honored to be standing amongst you, people who inspire me every single day, people who make art that they could be proud of, art for the present, the, the past, the future. It's peace and love. Hopefully Denzel knows who I am now. And thank you so much for this honor. Love you all, peace. New Edition was inducted into the Image Awards Hall of Fame. Here's some of their presentation. Wow, can y'all hear us? Wow, ladies and gentlemen, can y'all hear us up in this place tonight? This is such an honor. This is such an honor. So many people poured into us over the 40 plus years that we've been in this music industry. God, our creator. Our parents who gave us the gifts and the talents that we turned into our purpose. A gentleman that gave us our name, new addition, Mr. Brooke Payne. <laughs> gifts and talents without, it's like coal without someone to refine it and put the pressure on it, it doesn't turn into the diamonds that we are standing before you guys, right? So we thank you, Mr. Brooke Payne. Come on, man. Come on, man. Talk about it. Come on, man. The NAACP, yeah. as an organization, 1909, W.E.B. Du Bois, or Du Bois, depending on which Negro you hear it from, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> Sammy Davis, Harry Belafonte, Lena Horne, Ida B. Wells. So many shoulders we stand on top of right now. We thank you for providing us a firm foundation that we stand on today. 
Those any for lifers out there, come on, make some noise, y'all. Don't forget the beam. Come on, Mike. Yeah, ladies you know, and gentlemen. You know, I don't normally get to talk, but I had to take no, the you opportunity. Got it. Yeah. Listen, <laughs> listen. We stand here from Boston, straight out of Orchard Park Projects. We stand here for Washington, D.C. And more importantly, we stand here in brotherhood, okay? Y'all seen our story. You know what we've been through. But we call each other every day. We text each other every day. We check on our families. And we just want to say y'all watched us grow up. We're still growing. Get a ticket in the flight and hotel to Vegas. All right? I got you. Yeah. Come to Vegas. Come enjoy this. Our beautiful wives are there. And always know, New Edition was meant to be here. We just had to understand our purpose. And it's coming together tonight, y'all. We love you. And finally, Fantasia took home an NAACP Image Award for her work in The Color Purple. Thank you. <laughs> I, don't, um, I don't even have a, sp a speech. <laughs> um, because I didn't think I was going to win. Um, ooh. <laughs> I was afraid to play Celie, but I'm glad I did. Because I kept saying, if I don't win an award, the awards that I will win is the people who will watch Color Purple and the women who will relate to her and will feel like Oscars when they walk out. So, I didn't think I was gonna win it. <laughs> But I want to say thank you to my grandmother, who's in heaven right now, and my mother, who was the first queen that I saw, who carried herself with elegance and class, and showed me that any room that I walked in, I didn't have to compete with no one. My mother was a woman that went through a lot of things, but I saw her after everything she went through, walk out as a queen with a smile on her face. She always kept God first, and I will continue to do the same. This does not make me, but I thank you for it. But everything that I went through, God, 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 and the only God. So, 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 I know before I leave, I want to say to God, Night. A lot of different folks, but uh, the thing here, Julian uh, and uh, Derek, is that first of all, awards were given out over a three night period virtually uh, because there's so many different categories. Pre the pre show dinner was on Thursday night. Frankie Beverly uh, was honored. Some of the other people were honored as well. Uh, and it really, Julian, is about uh, black excellence, not just uh, when it comes to movies and music and television, but it's also podcasts, literary arts. It's, it's sort of a wide uh, variety. Uh, of folks who are honored. Absolutely. It is um, is an extravaganza. Years ago, I think 2011, one of my books was nominated for an Image Award. Didn't win, but it's just even an honor to be there. And it really is about black excellence. I regret the fact that the literary part does not have a, a bigger presence in a televised thing. But as you said, Roland, there are over, I guess, 100 categories. And these are, you know, people. These are the people who are feeding into this. So it really is about the people. I was happy to see Usher, happy to see Fantasia. And all the, um, obvious always, Queen Latifah just does the best job of hosting and lifting up. So this was about us, y'all. And that's what we have to remember. This is about us. The NAACP is our organization. 
I challenge those who are listening, who are not members, to get you a membership. Doesn't cost that much. And the NAACP is one of our legacy organizations that stands up for us. It has its flaws. There's some gender issues. But it still has been there since 1909. 1909. And so... Thank you for, for uh, lifting this up, Roland. This is really beautiful. You know, Derek, I wish they did. Uh, I wish they did uh, have a point uh, in the uh, in 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 the uh, televised portion to sort of shout out some of those the non entertainment categories because I just I've, and I've long said this that uh, I mean you've got news specials, news host. Uh, you know, the host I've won twice, best news special have won twice as well. Uh, I, I just think that. Uh, I, just, I think that we have to show America, but more importantly, black America, that we're not just actors and singers. And so to Julian's point, if you do that, even if you say, even if you just list be, you know, best new author, I mean, if, you, if you just take 30 to 45 seconds or even a minute to show those, uh, just, just the names of the winners, I just think that we have to push our people to think beyond just again the actors uh, and the and the singers. You know, Roland. You know, you have to ask the question: Why do we have the NAACP Image Awards to begin with, right? And and the reason why because no one else really showcased our black excellence, and we should highlight every category during the televised portion to not only help. Uh, market those uh, who are in those various uh, categories that are normally, you know, untold, right? We got a lot of untold uh, history makers in the black community. And so what better way during the NAACP Image Award, uh, during the televised portion to highlight those who are doing great things uh, on the local level, state level, n global level. Uh, we we got to do a better job in showcasing black excellence. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. All right. Uh, Derek, Julian, uh, as well as uh, Teresa, I certainly appreciate y'all joining us on today's show. You two folks, why y'all so slow? Y'all should be hitting these likes. We should easily get a 1,000 likes, all right? So hurry the hell up, hit that button right now, and let's hit a 1,000 before I sign off. Uh, so, again, let me thank my panel, Teresa, uh, Julian, as well as uh, Derek. All right, folks, you've been seeing the uh, the the trailer for the movie Shirley, uh, which launches, uh, of course, which is focused on Congresswoman Shirley Chisholm. Uh, it is going to air on Netflix on March 22nd. Tomorrow night, uh, they have the uh, red carpet and the in the world premiere screening of the movie. We will be there. We will be we will be streaming live on the red carpet. I will do the show tomorrow from 6 to 8 p.m. Eastern. So we'll be here for the show. Then we're going to take a 90 minute break, and then uh, at 9:30. 30 p.m. Eastern and go live from um, uh, the Egyptian theater, uh, which is uh, literally not far from where I'm uh, where I'm staying. So we're going to be live uh, broadcasting that red carpet, and then I'll be attending uh, the movie as well. Looking forward to that. Can't wait to see and chat with uh, Regina King. And so uh, that's going to be great. It's going to be really, really great to do that. And so we look forward to you uh, sticking with us. Don't forget, support us in what we do. Again, you two people, hurry up and hit that doggone like button. Let's hit 1,000. We're 13 away. Okay, you want to support us in what we do? Uh, please join our Bring the Funk Fan Club. Send your check and money order to P.O. Box 57196, Washington, D.C., 20037-0196. Cash App, Dallas Side RM Unfiltered, PayPal or Martin Unfiltered, Venmo's RM Unfiltered, Zale, Roland at RolandSMartin.com, Roland at RolandMartinUnfiltered.com. Download the Black Star Network app, Apple Phone, Android Phone, Apple TV, Android TV, Roku, Amazon Fire TV, Xbox One, Samsung. On Smart TV. You can also, of course, uh, watch our 24 hour, seven day week streaming channel. We're available on Amazon News. Go to Amazon Fire and check us out there. You can tell Alexa, play news from the Black Star Network. You can watch us on Plex TV, Amazon Freebie. Amazon Prime Video. And don't forget to get a copy of my book, White Fear, How the Browning of America is Making White Folks Lose Their Minds. Available bookstores nationwide, Ben Bella Books, Amazon, Barnes & Noble, IndieBound, Bookshop, Chapters, Books A Million, Target, and get the audio version. I'm reading it on Audible. That's it. I'll see y'all tomorrow right here on the Black Star Network. Roller Martin Unfiltered, live from Los Angeles. How? Black Star Network is here. I'm real um, revolutionary right now. Uh, thank you for being
being the voice of Black America. All momentum we have now, we have to keep this going. The video looks phenomenal. See, this difference between Black Star Network and Black-owned media and something like CNN. You can't be Black own media and be scared. It's time to be smart. Bring your eyeballs home. You dig?